Hey, Gail, how are you? Hey, and, how are you? Uh, <laughs> I'm doing time. well, I'm doing well. And uh, welcome to everyone that's able to enjoy this session. Thank you guys so much. I want to first of all thank Gail Crosley for joining Interhive and the team just to, for a fireside chat. And the ones that don't know Gail, I'm sure everyone in this room does, she's a leading strategic consultant that's been supporting uh, accounting firms, firms, professional firms for the last, uh, last couple of decades and helping firms uh, understand and achieve prof profitable and sustainable growth. Um, she started her early career in IBM, um, then went to PwC, but in the last uh, couple of years, she really has been the, the innovator and, and the thought leader in making sure uh, firms make, sustain growth and, and, and uh, getting, uh, getting to the next phase there. So I'm really honored to uh, um, host her here. We have five kind of scripted questions that we want to walk through. It's really kind of a casual conversation that we're going to have. But if there's any questions that you have as a, as a, at your firm, please feel free to enter them into the chat and we'll be able to curate them and, and ask them to Gail as we go throughout the session. Um, so really honored. First of all, Gail, thank you again. And thank you, the audience, for joining. And I'm really excited to uh, get some insights from you. So the first question, and what we want to go through, and this is kind of the theme, it's really about growth, but the pandemic really has caused a significant amount of de a demand, especially in the accounting space, and, and, and a subsequent uh, shortage of talent. Why talk about growth now? Well, um, before I start there, hello, audience. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's great to be here with you today to talk about strategic growth. And um, I will tell you that um, as a strategic organic revenue growth consultant, uh, when I tell people what I do, if they don't know me, they run the other way because it's like, we don't need any growth. We don't have any people. <laughs> <laughs> so, so your question's a good one, Tim. And uh, when you're looking at revenue growth in a firm over the longer haul, right? Not this very moment today, but over the longer haul, what kind of approach should you use? And there are really two approaches. One is what I call the roller coaster approach. And that is uh, you ride market conditions. And the other one is you, you grab hold of the, of, the, uh, of the future and you create your future and figure out what your future needs to be. And if you take a look at the last 20, 20 years of uh, maybe even more 30 years of year over year revenue growth percent, um, among the top 100 firms, it does look like a roller coaster and you'll get whiplash. And the uh, strategy of choice for those firms is we'll just ride market conditions. And that is an unspoken strategy, but it is a strategy nonetheless. But the firms who, who thrive, survive and thrive and have choices in their future, like, you know, not an emergency merger because we're, you know, we can't see the future, um, really are the ones who say, I'm going to remember that I have to look at the future and always be looking at the future. And I know we have a lot of marketing people on, on, the, on the line here today. And, you know, and marketing people are very much, um, you know, future centric, uh, some more than others. But nonetheless, you yeah. look at the future. And um, a lot of our firms are, you know, nose to the grindstone looking at the present. So yeah. that's why we have to look at uh, always be looking at strategic growth because strategic growth is sustainable growth and it is the most efficient growth and it's the most profitable growth and it is the growth that allows you to be here tomorrow and so that's why we're always looking at the future even when under our nose we have all kinds of business coming in. Yeah yeah that, that's that's very well put and I love I love the, the quote you gave there but I have a, a quick thing to just kind of double uh, to ask a little bit, a layer deeper there. I, I think what I've heard, and uh, this is stolen from a friend of mine, that a lot of firms are kind of blinded by their success right now, right? And and what strategies do you see that are happening that you see those firms that you talked about that that are approaching strategic growth right now? What what strategies are you seeing that they're implementing at this time? They really they look at growth as a strategic game and not a tactical game. And as a result of that, they look at where we are in our in our life cycle as a profession. And we are in a profession that is in the mature state, which is the fat cat state. And they know that as you go through, you know, the life cycle of a profession or an industry or a service, 
that you have to be true to the strategic imperative of the state that you are in. So if you're a really early um, uh, profession or an early industry, then you have a strategic imperative, which is to get early adopters. And that you don't, you're very clear eyed and you don't let anything else distract you from that. Mm -hmm. um, when you are in fat cat stage, which is where we are, and that is a very mature stage, we know that we're in it because our revenues have planed out and our margins are thin. So that's how we know we're in it. <laughs> and the, the strategic <laughs> objectives in fat cat are to innovate and drive efficiency. Okay. And so those firms are very, very focused. They've, they've moved from stage three, which is the cash cow, is to um, innovate and drive specialization. So they've already uh, adopted specialization. And if they haven't, they're, they're, they have to, be by, by the time they're in a fat cat, if they want to be surviving. So then you add the specialization that you either acquired in, in cash cow or specialization that you yet need to acquire along with innovation and efficiency. And so that's why they thrive is because they aren't distracted by, you know, the, the, the issues of today, they're handling the issues of today, but they've got one eye on today. And for the future, it's innovation, specialization, and driving efficiency. That's really, really well put. I think the fact is they have the foundation in place. So when the market as a market shifts, they just flow into their foundation already built out because they mm -hmm. have a strategy in place. And that's that's exactly the, right. That's yeah, exactly that's the, the clients that I work with, the ones that are that have that that calmness. I think that they all have that. And when, shifting a little bit, um, what is the difference in the growth approach during the disruptive times versus to the back back to normal times? When you have uh, what I'll call back back to normal times, Tim, it yeah. is more predictable and it is more incremental in terms of how you move and shift your strategy. And so your strategic growth in relatively calm times, and we did have a period of that before the cloud came on the scene, a pre-cloud, which was about seven to 10 years ago. Um, I remember there was, there was nothing happening. Um, in fact, there was so little happening that I was looking at two other buyer groups where there was a lot of stuff happening to add to my repertoire. And I was right on the verge of going into another buyer group, adding a second buyer group when the cloud hit and the cloud just changed everything. <clears throat> so since that time, we've had major thunderbolts hitting us, four big ones, and they're all hitting us at the same time. So we are in a time of enormous disruption. And when this happens, your strategy can't shift incrementally. It, I mean, to, like that. You know, when the pandemic hit is a good example. I mean, like that, the strategy shifted because of PPP and some other things. Um, and so what that means <clears throat> is that you can't be slow about it and you can't be assumptive about it. So you can't say, well, I'm just going to slowly move like I always have. Um, and you can't be assumptive that it's going to be the way that it always has been. A case in point is our problem with pruning the client base. You know, we're having a hard time because we're attacking that with a really a relatively incremental, slow pace. And at the same time, the fish are jumping in the boat. And, you know, it's like enough already. This is not about that. So if you take a look at the three elements of strategy um, that in normal times, you would take these three elements of strategy and and tweak them a little bit, kind of like a combination lock, right? You'd you'd move it a you know a, 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 a number or two on the dial, and you'd be good. And now it's like, wait a minute! All of a sudden, my buyer group has to shift. All of a sudden, my service has to shift. All of a sudden, my distribution channels have to shift, and they have to shift sometimes fairly significantly and fairly quickly. Unfortunately, in our profession, we are not wired for fast movement. So we have been caught flat-footed, and the and as a result of that, we have you know all these clients that we shouldn't be doing work for in this environment, um, and going forward probably, and we are stretching our people, and we're you know just I mean we're getting all the juice out of the orange, so we're keeping we're hanging on to all the clients, and mm -hmm. meanwhile exhausting all our staff. And I see this and I see that that's an example, that it's a manifestation of an indicator that 
we are not um, in alignment with the what we have to do when we're in these disruptive times. Disruptive times require strategic thinking for sure, because you can't just come in and prune out all your clients. You've got to be very strategic about it. And it also requires moving faster than we're ever, you know, used to moving. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the one thing you brought up there and a lot of, I think there were a lot of golden nuggets there to be honest, but pruning your clients, I think that's, I'm hearing it all the time. I'm hearing that all these firms are trying to understand and they don't even know where to start, right? A lot of them don't really know where to start. So just to dive, uh, dive into that a little bit, what strategies would you suggest to a firm as they're trying to look at their client base to figure out the, the ones they really should serve and the ones they should kind of let go? Perfect. Perfect question. And a lot of the work I'm doing right now with my clients is in this area. I'll tell you what you shouldn't do. You should not rank them A, B, C, D, and then try to kick out the Ds. Yeah. I mean, and I've been telling, I've been saying this for 20 years. I never was a proponent of it. I'm still not a proponent of it. Um, number one, it doesn't work consistently. And number two, it is, um, and, and it goes to the very heart of the, well, <laughs> Um, it goes to the very heart of what we are built on in our profession, and that is the client um, professional relationship. And you're you're going in the middle of that and saying, "Break it." Mm -hmm. it it's it just it does it does not work. And you you on on the the uh, on the Zoom here know that you know there are there are a list of of you know excuses as long as my arm about Aunt Sally and my neighbor, and he's been with me 30 years and all that stuff. And so the way that you do it is that you step back and you look at it strategically through industry and service line leaders within your uh, firm. You do financial analysis around each of those business units, around the audit business unit, the tax business unit, the construction business unit, the non-for-profit business unit, and you create your watch list at the business unit level of those that are not, you know, that, are, that don't meet the, the criteria for whatever that business unit is. For example, um, profitability across our firm needs to be realization of 80 percent. Well, wait a minute. That's not true in nonprofit. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not true in 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 um, in business valuation services, you know. And so one is 50%, the other is 95%, uh, you know? So there are a lot of things like that. There are other factors like strategic factors. I mean, I, I was working with a firm in the Northeast uh, six months ago in New Jersey and they, um, the construction leader, they were ready to whack out three heavy highway clients <laughs> when, when the infrastructure bill was coming down the pipe. <laughs> You know, I mean, so we got to get rid of this. It's the book of business partner. And you tell him to get Aunt Sally out of there. When you do it at the business unit level, then what happens is you have a dispassionate um, leader that is saying, here is what's going on. And you create watch lists with plans, three year plans. Some are going today. Some are going in a year. Some are going in three. And when I say go, what I mean is change pricing increases, moving it off to India, whatever the plan is for that particular business unit. And I'm just hitting the top of the waves right now because there's another whole piece, which is let's shift over also. The other piece is a key account, key account program or key client program. So when you get this going out the bottom and then you have a focus on the key client program and the percent of revenue that's coming out of your key clients, and then you're focusing there so that you have the confidence that you're going to be able to fill up that the revenue that you're losing with near term revenue that you might be able to touch um, and then fan that out into the market later. Um, then you have a program that can be implemented and you have peer pressure coming from mm. not only the service line leader, but the industry leader on the book of business leader that, hey, you know, you're you're hurting our bottom lines. And eventually, if you have a larger firm where their compensation is tied to profitability and revenue growth, well, then you're really hurting their paycheck also. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And just to go 
just to ask you a little bit, Paul, there is, that's another thing that, I, that I've, I've been seeing, like, um, do you, how do you advise firms to make the profile of a key client? Is there certain characteristics that you look for, certain numbers? Yeah. Um, key clients should be um, a list high to low. You start with a list high to low on revenue and what percent of your revenue is within that client group. And then you add to that clients that are to that list, strategically significant, and you add to that clients that are at risk. And I have, when I work with firms on this, I have an at risk, know the signs, you know, kind of checklist. Um, and as a result of that, we, we have that list now. And what we can do is we can create our special programs like strategic planning at the client level mm -hmm. internally to start with. We can have client, exe we can have executive sponsors who are uh, partners in our firm or the managing partner and other C-level people. And a lot of, you know, a promotional, a special pricing. They get to be a part of our early adopter programs. There's all kinds of things you can do with that. But basically, that's where the starting spot is. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just to go to the next question that we have listed out, what do you see as the biggest obstacle to future, uh, future firm growth? I know we kind of talked about the client section serving the right people, but what do you think is the biggest obstacle in, in, in the future? Yeah, um, Tim, I think the biggest obstacle right now is the, the lack of future think. Mm. It's just future think has evaporated. And we have, except for the firms that are really, you know, really understand that if you don't future think, you will have no future. You'll, you'll be riding market conditions and um, therefore you won't get the best clients. You won't get the best people. You won't get the highest earnings uh, in your pockets. Um, because and, and you won't have that high sustainability needed. So the, the, the rest of the firms that aren't doing future thing, what I say to them is you have to be very purposeful about it because you can it's so easy to get sucked into the day to day that, you know, it, you know, you're putting out fires all day long, all day long. And but if you say, OK, wait a minute, we got to go off site. And we've got to do strategic planning, but not in the way that we've done it for many, many years, which is an incremental, okay, you know, what do we have to do about tomorrow? No, it's like, well, let's bifurcate our strategic plan into what do we got to get out the door right now today? Okay, we've got all those things to talk about. Now, let's step back and let's, let's look at the really big picture. Private equity coming in, AI and, and, and machine learning and bots taking away our our low end business entirely, yep. right? A reason why we're there in the first place, um, and on and on and on, and and at in that way we can really. And then there might be some other mechanical things that we do, but we have to be really purposeful about it. Know that it's happening, and know that we can't mortgage it. We've got to have somebody. We'll come to it maybe later in terms of major opportunities. We've got to put some investments in these couple of opportunity areas, period. We can't, you know, say, oh, we'll do that two years from now. Um, so those are some of the things. That's the, the biggest obstacle right now. And the, you work with a lot of firms, uh, small, medium, large firms as well. Um, for What makes the difference there, the ones that are attacking this obstacle well and the ones that are a little bit in the, in the lagger and they're, they're, they're a little behind it? Is it leadership? Is it having that structure with the foundation, with the industry groups and service line leaders? Um, what, what do you think is the, the, the indicator of assess, assess it, uh, and for that future mindset? Um, I think it is really a commitment to continuous improvement of, of strategy and, and strategic thinking. I see, I see <laughs> one of our leaders in the profession called it FAUX strategy, F-A-U-X, you know. <laughs> That's funny. You know, we're zooming ourselves. You know, it's a FAUX strategy. We go off and we say, okay, we, we want a one-page one strategic plan. I like one-page strategic plans, by the way. But we're going to do a one-page strategic plan and we're going to do it, you know, and it's a mechanical exercise, right? Mm -hmm. Or we want to include a bunch of people in here so that they can really have, you know, visibility to what we're doing. But there's no strategic bone in their body or they're not tasked with being strategy thinkers they're 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 the worker bees yeah and so you get it watered down so there's all kinds of problems with strategic planning right now in our profession 
<laughs> but the ones who really get it are the ones who, you know, they, they, they get it. They, they've got some really good, they have strategic planning facilitators. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a difference between when Gail Crosley comes in and facilitates and when Joe, who you, you know, you work with every day, you know, is facilitating your strategic yeah. plan. Yeah, but I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure that definitely you notice it right away. You would know right away, I'm guessing, as soon as you walk in the firm, you have that first meeting, what, what it's going to be. Um, we have another question that just came in, and it kind of ties into this, too, because this is a top of mind uh, question right now. Is like, what are firms doing to have the best luck with retention and recruitment? Obviously, the lack, the talent, it's being, everyone's, it's called the war of talent right now, because like you said, there's so much work, work going in and on that side, but what do you see? What do you, what are what do you think? That, what are the firms that you see that are doing the best in recruitment and retention doing? Um, now, this is not in my wheelhouse, so I'm only going to give you a uninformed opinion. Okay, but my uninformed opinion is I will take a page out of the book from my IBM days. Hmm. IBM was the best recruiting retention company that I ever have worked for. And I've worked for nine companies in my career. I mean, my, my resume looks like a checkerboard, which is why I have my own company now. <laughs> but what we did was we created a culture where uh, we had one, one sign on the door of, of, you know, by the elevators of every IBM office. And that was the number one principle. And that was respect for the individual. And mm -hmm. everything flowed from there. Our, our training program uh, flowed from there. Our, our recruitment flowed from there. Everything flowed from there. And it was all about the, the employee experience. The employee experience was number one. We always paid top dollar for the best people. Now, we could afford to because we had a really strong strategy. You know, you can't afford to pay for good people if you don't have a strong strategy because you you can't you can't outpace your competitors. Yeah. Uh, so I keep coming back to strategy, but um, there are some firms around that are doing a beautiful job with this. We are a profession of Johnny Come Latelys to the party, relative to the best practices in recruiting and retention. Like we don't we we have been hesitant to play to pay executive search fees. That's an example. No, oh, that's too expensive. Well, when I came from, I came from technology. That was one of our big line items, expense line items. We knew we had to get the best people. And um, we had at IBM, we would have monthly meetings where the, man, the, the branch manager would get up in front of the crowd and say, I want to reward 20 people in this room who did jobs that went above and beyond. Susie, come on down front. Here's a $3,000 check because you saved that client. Mm. Uh, Joe, come on down. I'm giving you $5,000 because Joe just sold the, the largest deal that he's ever sold in his, in his career. Those are the kinds of things I'm talking about. After, um, after work activities where we bonded consistently with our peers were purposeful. They weren't uh, a nice to have now and then. They were built into the culture. Mm. So those are the kinds of things I'm talking about. I'm sure that's the, like the morale boost, right? I, I'm sure that, that sounds amazing. Sounds amazing. And we're going to go to the next. Nirvana. Part. It was nirvana. IBM was Nirvana. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. I have a, we're, we're going to try to get some of your secret sauce a little bit. What's your number one growth strategy recommendation right now? My number one recommendation is specialization. And, you know, I recommend a lot of things, but this is the absolute requirement for where we are in our life cycle, which I mentioned before. And people, you know, when I talk to a firm, they'll say, oh, we have specialization. And I'll say, yeah, well, I'm thinking to myself, well, yeah, you have beef, but there's Ruth's Chris Steakhouse and there's McDonald's and they're both beef. OK, <laughs> uh, I, and then I start drilling down. OK. Do you have industry leaders and, and, and service line leaders? Kind of, sort of. Okay. We have a few. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about the full lineup. Okay. Yep. And what is their job? Oh, they're supposed to become, become famous in a market. That's not an, a, an industry leader. The industry leader and the service line leader in a highly specialized firm is responsible for strategic direction and financial health of that chunk of revenue of the firm. 
like the president of a business unit. And that's way beyond let's go be famous in a market. And that's way beyond, well, we have a couple of them. You know, in corporate America, you don't have like a couple of leaders and then the rest of the products or services and industries are kind of just floundering around out there. Everything is in a, you know, it's either non-for-profit or it's, you know, it's medical or it's real estate or it's all other, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying you won't have a slot pot of, you know, other stuff. But the point about it is that you're very organized and these people are very uh, focused on strategic direction, financial health. And when you do that, then you get out, you get both feet into the into the world of tomorrow and you leave that world of individual book of business partner, you know, contribution, do the best I can through referral sources, catching a fish at a time, generalist, you know, where we, you know, we serve everybody. And you get into a leader driven team based strategic capturing markets at a time specialist. And when you get both feet over there, that's my number one recommendation. Yeah, I, I, I remember talking about that with you on Monday, and I, I think it's uh, very innovative, and I, I definitely see that as the way of the future. I have kind of a couple couple questions there. Um, when the firms that are doing this, do you see them having um, these industry leaders having? I think it really just enables scalability, right? Having scalability in, in a lot of different ways. Do you see these industry leaders that have this set up having having their own sales meetings or pipeline meetings um, in alignment with? growing that group. Do you see that in, in the firms that you talk to that are, that are there? On the on the high end of the market, I work almost exclusively in the top 400 and uh, mostly over the years in the top 100. And um, the higher up you get, uh, the more of that, you know, um, they are doing. And when I come into a firm, they're usually, they got a foot dragging over here in this world, or maybe even two feet over there. Um, but by the time we're done, they know how to do it. And then they start down the path of developing it. And then, you know, when I check in with them years later, they are doing that. They're doing sales meetings at the industry level. They're doing pipeline management at the industry level. Not at the beginning. The beginning is just, you know, where's the bathroom and where's the coffee <laughs> pot? Um, but, but when you build it out, you know, you, you set them on a road somewhere and they just keep continuing down that road. And these are some of the manifestations of that continuing improvement down that specialization road. Love it. Love it. And this is our final question. Um, what are some of the growth opportunities you see in the future? Again, trying to dip into the secret sauce. So there are a lot of opportunities for a lot of firms hither and yon. Um, cannabis, um, cryptocurrency, you know, uh, SPACs, um, you know, but there are two that are overarching that all of the firms, every single firm should be starting down the road of committing to, mm -hmm. and they are both equally important. One is ESG and the other one is blockchain. Now, since blockchain is only evident now in the in the digital asset slash cryptocurrency world, I'm, I'm, I'm putting that as kind of one and the same. But blockchain is going to go way beyond that into distribution and all, all kinds of other business use cases. But those two things are not going away. Those two things are when I appear in the future, they're here and they're only going to get bigger. And so any incremental investment that is made either in ESG or blockchain digital currency are going to be investments that are not wasted. And it's only a matter of how quickly they unfold. We've already got firms out here in the mid market who are doing work in both those places. And we have started them. I, I start these with my clients um, it, from literally nothing. And blockchain, uh, I've been helping firms with, with that for about eight years now, from the very beginning, right? Mm -hmm. And um, ESG is now just starting. We ha now just uh, have our few, first few firms that have their first few projects. But it's like getting anything off the ground. I helped firms get cannabis off the ground when it was first starting up, or yeah. SPACs when it was first starting up. There's, there's a methodology to starting up something when you have no clients and you have no knowledge. And so what I say to you is go get some knowledge in these two 
and start your investment in them because they will be very wise investments that you won't have to throw in the trash bin. Awesome advice. I really appreciate it. We have one final question. If you just have uh, 30 more seconds, our good friend Gabe, sure. uh, Gabe actually came in and it's about specialization. Um, he's saying, do you believe there, there's a direct correlation from firm size and your ability to truly position specialization? And the second half of that question is, what advice do you have for firms outside of the top 50 to achieve specialization effectively? Yeah, okay. Um, the second part of the question is, uh, what what do you have to do to achieve it? Um, what, what, do you, what, advice, um, what advice do you um, do you have for firms outside of the top 50 to achieve specialization effectively? Got it, okay. So the answer to the part one is yes, specialization is applicable to a one person firm all the way up the food chain because of where we are in our life cycle. We are in fat cat stage and specialization is the order of the day. So if you were starting out today and hanging out your shingle, it should be specialization from day one uh, from any size. And then the thing, if you're if you're smaller than the top 50, and I've worked with a number of firms that were four and a half, five million dollars, you know, especially early in my in my days. Um, the number one thing is revenue segmentation matrix, which is a big spreadsheet in the sky. Take the revenues of your firm, put them in the lower right hand corner, whatever the revenues are, half a million, a million, a billion, it doesn't matter, and get your columns or your industries and your rows are your service lines and populate it with the revenues of your firm that are coming into your firm now from clients and start there with what have we got now? Yeah. And then once you do that, you're going to start seeing, okay, we should put leaders in charge of these things. And so that's really your first step, your starting spot. I have done it for my firm for years and continue to do it, even though I'm a sole practitioner. Okay. I have, I have my market segments and I have my my services and I know exactly where revenues are coming from. And I'm always looking at what am I going to do for which row and column? So it's applicable from one partner or one person all the way up to the big four. Awesome. Well, thank you, uh, Gail. I really appreciate it. And thank you, uh, audience as well, for joining us. It was a really powerful session. And Thanks, Gail, for uh, uh, sharing some of your secrets and truly appreciate it. Can't thank you enough. And just wish, I wish you have a great rest of your day and everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, audience. Bye-bye. Have a good yeah. one.